Good afternoon. Um, I'm very happy to be here in Guernsey. I'm a programmer from uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. And that means that for 30-something years, I lived in a troubling democracy and in a troubling economy. And uh, as a programmer, I know that at the end of the day, these are just systems. And like any other systems, any other system, it can be hacked. Um, so with a group of friends, with a group of peers, we figured if we could hack politics, hack the political system. Why? Well, I'm part of a new generation that it's usually called uh, millennials, but uh, it's not the year 2000 what defines us. What really changed us is the internet. And uh, as I grew up in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, connected online, I figured, why isn't the internet connected to our political system, to our government? So we figured a strategy, an initial tactic, to do just that, to connect the internet directly to our political system. And the hack we implemented uh, is a very well-known hack throughout the history of civilization. It's called the Trojan tactic, also known as changing the system from within. And in order to do this, we created an open source software called Democracy OS, like a do-it-yourself Facebook, uh, where you can get informed, debate, and vote. Um, but this software had an offline component called the Net Party, Partido de la Red, a political party that has candidates committed to always vote in Congress according to what citizens decide on Democracy OS. We started this tactic back in 2012, and we literally built a Trojan horse. Uh, we ran for elections in 2013. We got 1% of the votes. It wasn't enough to get a candidate elected, but it was enough to implement the software in the Congress of Buenos Aires and run the first digital democracy pilot in the American continent. And uh, we learned a lot throughout that process. And uh, I certainly learned a lot about the process of starting up a political party in Latin America. And as, we went through, as I went through this process, I identified the enemy we were trying to fight. And that's corruption. Many, many uh, funny stories about the experience of uh, starting up in politics. Uh, we identified we had a couple of secret service agents infiltrating our party uh, that had the mission to ask us for a bribe uh, for a federal judge so we can get a legally able party for the 2015 election. And I know this because I was the one being asked to pay a $100,000 bribe to a federal judge. So it was heartbreaking to see how corrupt and how nasty uh, political systems are, especially in the developing world. And Democracy OS also, we identify some flaws. At the end of the day, whoever gets to run the server also gets to decide who gets to vote and even can manipulate the code in order to uh, change or modify the votes. Because we were opening up the source code of the software, but open source is really about opening up the black box that needs to get opened up. And that black box is literally the ballot box, who gets to count the votes, who gets to watch the watchmen. So this phrase from Buckminster Fuller, an architect from San Francisco, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. I think it perfectly synthesizes the ethos and the mindset of Silicon Valley. And in 2015, we received a call from Y Combinator, considered today the most important investment firm in all of Silicon Valley, to build a nonprofit, a global nonprofit that really looks 
at the problem of our democracy at a global scale. So we are now working on a new tactic, 10x improvement. 10x improvement in the same way that a word processor is a 10x improvement to a typewriter. Or 10x improvement in the same way that email is 10x improvement to fax. That's how Silicon Valley disruption works. And our challenge is to do 10x improvement to government. So how are we going to do this? Well, we need focus. We need to focus on the core building block that makes government possible, on the core social technology that makes uh, everything work. And that's voting. How we can do voting in the 21st century. We actually vote every day. When we put a like on Facebook, when we do a retweet on Twitter, when we do an app vote on Reddit, when we put a heart on Instagram, when we link a website on a post, we're voting. We're always voting. It's the main interaction we have with the internet every day. Now, this kind of voting, it's strictly limited to editorial use. It has no institutional implications whatsoever. No matter how many likes I put on Facebook, I don't get to decide how Mark Zuckerberg spends his money. So this is fantastic because this the web that we have inherited, but it's not the full potential of the internet. What if we are able to build a free, standard, open protocol like an e-vote in the same way that we have email that has real implications for any kind of organization, be it the administration of a building, a community, a country club, or an entire nation. So we started democracy.earth. That's actually our uh, domain name, our website. It's the only uh, website in the internet right now with a .earth domain. So if you type democracy.earth, you will find more information about what we're doing. And we're a nonprofit uh, foundation in San Francisco, California, trying to build the specific technology to do exactly this. Now, a vote requires these elements. First, institutional commitment. Whatever institution uh, is using this technology binds its decisions to the outcome of the vote. Second, what differentiates voting from a survey or a poll is proper identity verification. This is the key to legitimacy in any decision happening in a democratic environment. And finally, the black box. Who gets to count the votes and how the votes are counted? There's a rising new technology that has very powerful implications for the future of the internet and governance at a global scale. And this is the Bitcoin blockchain. Probably you heard to, uh, and read about Bitcoin, about blockchains, about which one is better than the other. But a blockchain without Bitcoin is just a distributed database uh, that is easier to hack. Bitcoin is a very important innovation. And what the Bitcoin blockchain is, is basically a network that has democratized transactions in the same way that the internet has democratized messaging. Now, the difference between a transaction and a message is that that transaction also involves, other than information, trust. And trust is the building block of every single institution in the world right now. And this technology, means that we can start coding new kinds of organizations, new kinds of institutions, directly with software. It redefines the nature of law. So today, we live in a world with centralized identity. In the 20th century, we've been through nation states that gave us passports, and we use these passports to move from one nation state to the other. 
to a world with passwords to move from access to the data we store in one corporation to the other online. And the world today looks pretty much like this. Our data, our identities are stored fundamentally by very few large organizations that have centralized our own way of identificating in a public open network that belongs to all of humanity. So we want to use the blockchain first to do a new way of authentication online, a new way of identifying ourselves online, and even leaving up to us if we want to remain anonymous online. In some countries, anonymity is very important, especially when you are doing political activism because uh, you get the risk to be put in a blacklist by the government if you express in a network your political preferences. In other places, identity is very important too, because you want to really identify that the voters are real. But we want to leave that option to the users, where instead of storing a secret, a password, in a server of an organization we do not know, we can start storing that password, that key, in our own digital device, in our smartphone, in our local device we use every day, in our own computer, and use the blockchain for uh, uh, providing the necessary trust to authenticate our identity. Then we can start opening the black box. The blockchain is a public database, so every single vote gets stored in a database that can be analyzed by anyone without even requiring the use of our software. That's 100% transparency for any kind of election. And that means that every voter gets to count the votes of every other voter while preserving the anonymity of those who want to vote in secret. And finally, explore the idea of delegating power in a new way. Instead of having representatives based on territory, we can start electing representatives that we know personally, that we can trust them because they are friends of ours, or that we meet them at work, or they're part of our community, and get them to represent us in the bills for certain topics. I have a friend that knows a lot about the environment and that is very passionate about the environment, and I want him, I trust him to vote for me on issues that have to do with the environment. This new way of dynamic representation has tremendous implications on the way we do governance and democracy. It's about doing peer review. And peer review is a great way of arriving to legitimate decisions in any organization. So I'm not talking about direct democracy, representative democracy, liquid democracy. I'm talking about democracy, period. Democracy is always a work in progress. If you go back to the origins of the concept, the Greeks, the wise Greeks, used to use the word agora. And agora etymologically means thinking with others. They use the agora as a technology. That's how they call the park where they gathered to think with others. And the verb agora meant speaking and thinking with others. Even in some verses of the great Greek poets, agora is often found as an antonym of war, of making war. And democracy is this force that has been going throughout history that keeps liberating people around the world. Now, you may say, I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. Thank you.